evening, ladies and gentlemen. Again, thank you for being with us. This evening we're reporting to you that we've diagnosed an additional 359 cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number now so diagnosed to 20,612-20612. There's an, an additional uh, 43 deaths notified to us uh, since yesterday, bringing the total number to 1,232-1232. There has been one denotification since yesterday. Uh, a detailed breakdown of 1,011 laboratory confirmed uh, deaths showed that 463 had been hospitalized at some point, that's 45.8%. 57 had been admitted to intensive care, that's 5.6%. 878 had report, we had reports of an underlying medical condition, that's 86.8%. The male-female breakdown of those deaths was 53% male, 47% female. The median age is 83, the median and the mean age is 81. And a more detailed breakdown of incident cases to Tuesday night to the 28th of April at midnight, where we had 20,111 cases. 2,706 of those had been hospitalised, that's 13.5%. 360 had been admitted to intensive care at some point, that's 1.8%. 28.3 are healthcare workers, percent I should say, 28.3% are healthcare workers. The median age of those incident cases is 49, and the male-female breakdown is 42% male, 58% female. A more detailed breakdown of 362 intensive care unit admissions 123 of those remain in intensive care at the point at which this analysis was done. Uh, that's 34.1%. Uh, 182 had been discharged alive from intensive care units. That's 50%. Uh, 57 had died, as I've already said, in intensive care units. That's 15.8% of those admissions to intensive care. The median age of those admissions is 60 and we have reports of underlying medical conditions in 302 or 83.7%. To give you the more detailed breakdown then of cases uh, and clusters and deaths in nursing home and community residential facilities. So in all community residential facilities, we've now had reports of 371 clusters, that's an increase of two since yesterday, and 219 of which are in nursing homes, and that's the same number as yesterday, no additional nursing home identified since yesterday. Total number of cases, uh, we've had 4,590 cases identified in those community residential facilities, that's an increase of 227 cases since yesterday. We've had 3,679 cases identified in nursing homes, that's an increase of 222 since yesterday, so that's 222 of the total number of 227 increase from yesterday uh, in association with nursing homes. Uh, in terms of admission to hospital, 348 of the cases across community residential facilities, or 7.6% of the 4,590 such cases were admitted to hospital at some point and 233 of the cases, the 3,679 cases in nursing homes were admitted to hospital, that's 5.1%. Uh, in terms of deaths, we've had uh, 735 deaths uh, notified in association with residents of uh, community residential facilities, 630 of those are in respect of nursing homes. And that 735 represents 59.7% of all the, the deaths notified to us. Uh, the 630 in nursing homes accounts for slightly more than half, or 51.1% of all notified deaths. And in terms of those uh, nursing home and community residential facilities uh, and the deaths in those locations by, by, ver by location of death, 123 uh, of those cases died in uh, hospital environment, that's 16.7% across, across all community resident facility, residential facilities, uh, and 99 of the uh, 630 in nursing homes died in hospital environments, that's 15.7%.
have a slightly more detailed breakdown of uh, the healthcare worker experience. So as of midnight on Tuesday night, there were 5,627 uh, healthcare workers who were infected at some point. Uh, uh, 210 of those were hospitalized at some point during the course of their illness, that's 3.7%. Uh, 34 uh, of those were admitted to intensive care, that's 0.6%. Uh, there were five deaths uh, in association with those incident cases of uh, infection in healthcare workers, that's 0.1%. The median age of these cases is 41. The breakdown of males and females is 27% male, 73% female. And just by category, 34% uh, of those cases are nurses, 24% are allied healthcare professionals, a further 24% are healthcare assistants. 7% are doctors and slightly over 1% are porters. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Philip to give us a little more detail on what we're seeing in terms of our modelling data. Very good. Um, so I want to do two things. I, I am going to talk to you a little bit about the reproduction number of the disease in the population as a whole, but before I do that, um, we've been living with this for a number of weeks now, and I think it's important to go back to the beginning of the epidemic and remember how it behaved uh, at the onset of this disease. Um, so if we go back to uh, the run-up to the 13th of March, when the first set of social distancing uh, measures, the 11th 13th of March, um, I'm going to show you, first of all, the number of cases we were detecting. Um, and by that, I mean the number of new cases confirmed each day plus any tests that were done in Germany that were backdated subsequently, so the, the number of, of, of detections. So we were detecting 20 to 40 new cases per day. In blue, I'm going to show you the number of people that were in hospital, and these are all five-day averages, but on a typical day, how many people were in hospital? There were about 40 people uh, in hospital um, on, on the 11th of March. Um, so, so those immediate measures were introduced. Schools and universities were closed, pubs closed not long after, uh, and what you might call moderate social distancing uh, implemented. Despite those measures, uh, over the next two weeks and the run-up to the end of March, the number of new cases per day being detected rose very, very sharply uh, to the point where in that week of the 28th of March um, we were looking at uh, uh, 450 or so new cases per day the number of people in hospital also rose uh, very sharply to around the same figure, 450 or so people in hospital. Um, the much stronger social distancing measures and a stay-at-home order, effectively, was introduced on the 28th of March. And if you look at the cases detected per day after that, that measure uh, clearly choked off transmission of the disease very promptly. So within a few days, Excuse me. the number of confirmed, of confirmed cases was plateauing and has remained stable in the kind of 400 to 600 new cases per day uh, ever since. Um, however, uh, people had been infected prior to that. The number of people in the hospital continued to rise uh, quite, quite a deal, uh, plateauing at almost 900 people uh, in mid-April. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, a very sharp indicator um, if we go back again to the period just after St. Patrick's Day, there was a very sharp increase in the number of people in intensive care. Um, so again, in, in the week, just the five days um, from Monday the 22nd of March to Friday the 28th of March, that day uh, when the disease was clearly spreading very rapidly and the decision was made uh, to implement very strong social distancing measures, we went from 150 to 600 new cases a day, 170 people in hospital to 440 people in hospital, uh, and 50 people in intensive care to 80 people in intensive care. That was in the course of five working days in one week, and you, you all remember that period of time. And after the 28th of March, the number of people in intensive care continued to rise. So in the 10-day period from the 25th of March to the 4th of April, we went from having 50 people in intensive care to 140 people in intensive care, and that peaked at 160 uh, people sometime later. So just want to remind people that, that even though uh, the transmission of the disease in the population appears to be static, 
And even though the number of people in hospital and the number of people in intensive care is falling, when you look at the points towards the end of that chart, those numbers are still very significantly higher than they were uh, in that week, running up to the 28th of March, um, when we had to put in place those measures. So those measures have had a very significant effect on transmission of the virus, but they have yet to uh, eliminate the disease from our hospitals and our intensive care units. So just to go on a little bit further, uh, when you look at that, the number of new cases per day um, across the entire population, it's important to think about, well, where are we now detecting those cases? So the next slide shows you uh, the number of new cases detected are positive tests by the date the test was done, and you'll be familiar with these charts, and not the date that it was confirmed here, but looking back, when was the test actually taken? Because that's the best indicator uh, we have of when that particular case emerged. So looking at that, this plot is showing you people who are neither healthcare workers nor residents in long-term residential care. So they're people in the, the general population, if I can put it that way. And as with these uh, charts, the last few data points are unreliable because there will have been some swabs taken, not yet tested or reported upon. So you see a very sharp increase in the number of cases detected in the general population, if you will, up until the 28th of March, and then following uh, strong social distancing, a very rapid decline, uh, some changes, but there's been a very marked reduction of the number of new cases per day we're detecting in the general population. So following its transmission within the broader population in blue, if you now look at, in red, healthcare workers alone, uh, healthcare workers catch this disease by being exposed to sick people. Uh, so we see, we detect the disease in healthcare workers later than we detect it in the general population. And because there's still a significant prevalence of the disease in the general population, the number of uh, cases we're detecting in healthcare workers has been stable uh, over the course of the month of April, uh, though there are recent indications that it is beginning to decline. And then there has been a lot of discussion appropriately on the situation in long-term residential care. So in green, uh, we're looking at the number of cases per day detected in long-term residential care by the date the swab was taken. Uh, the disease entered long-term residential care uh, later than it appeared in the general population, significantly later. And over the last week or so, uh, a little bit longer, you're seeing an increase in detection in long-term residential care uh, due to that very targeted testing within long-term residential care, uh, detecting uh, several hundred cases uh, on the background of the large number of cases that already existed in that setting. So I think it's important to say, first of all, uh, that there's still a very significant prevalence of disease or incidence of disease and prevalence in the population, and that it's divided into three segments, what's going on in the broader population, what's happening with healthcare workers, and what's happening in long-term residential care, uh, where cases are either still rising uh, or perhaps beginning to plateau, as, as some data is showing us. In that context, then, uh, the overall growth rate of the disease in the population has been close to zero, as I've mentioned to you before, since the beginning of April. So the very strong social distancing measures taken uh, at the end of March, beginning of April, have been very effective. There being, of course, three components to that, the general population, healthcare workers, and long-term residential care. When we look at the reproduction rate then, uh, reproduction number, I should say, uh, for the entire population. I'm just going to show you two of the ways we have of looking at that. Uh, one is a statistical technique uh, called time-dependent reproduction number, uh, which looks back on all of the confirmed cases by the date the test was done. And you can see the reproduction number that says was very close to five. Uh, that's the line. And the blue shading is the confidence interval, the statistical confidence interval we have around that. And you'll see, looking at the x-axis, that very soon after the 28th of March, uh, that number which had been brought down by the earlier social distancing measures was brought comfortably uh, below one. Uh, we now estimate it to be 0.8 with a confidence interval of 0.75 to 0.85. 
you've seen before this second way of estimating, which is a model estimate where you give the model uh, information on the number of cases, information on the number of deaths, uh, and you also uh, program into the model the timing of various social distancing uh, interventions. So the previous uh, model doesn't know uh, what we did to control the disease, it just monitors its spread. This model knows. It suggests uh, that the reproduction number uh, before any social distancing was, was 3.6, and there is always uncertainty with these. You're never going to get a precise answer uh, for reproduction numbers. So that's on the right panel. The, the left panel is, is the recorded deaths. The, the right panel is our estimate of reproduction number. So uh, before any social distancing measures, we estimate the reproduction number was 3.6. That's on, on the left of that panel. And on the right of that panel, we currently estimate with this model to be lower uh, at 0.5. And that's where you're getting the estimate has been somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8. It depends on what technique you use uh, to measure it. The important message is both of those models are confident that the reproduction number is currently below one. Uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning is you've seen this before, but you've seen it run with less data. Now that there's more data, we have a closer picture as to the effect of the interventions between the 13th of March and the 28th of March, the more moderate social distancing. That estimates a reproduction number of around 1.7. And from previous presentations, you will know that's too high. So even though it's a lower estimate than we had previously, it's still the case we can't go back to that point. It should leave us optimistic, I think, that uh, we can find some control regime uh, that puts us between where we are now at a very low reproduction number and that at 1.7. And then just to close out, as a very quick reminder to look again at, in blue here, uh, from the beginning of the epidemic to today, uh, the typical number of people in hospital, uh, peaking at close to 900, still very high at around uh, 730. And the number in green, the number of admissions per day, uh, peaking at close to 100 admissions per day uh, at the peak of the outbreak, uh, now down to below 40 but that's still 30 to 40 people being admitted to our hospitals every day right now uh, with COVID-19. And then the final slide uh, reminding you, you've seen the, the blue plot already, uh, the number of people in intensive care over the course of the epidemic peaking at close to 160, uh, uh, now uh, down to just a little bit over 100, and the number of admissions per day peaking at 14 to 15 per day uh, now down to closer to four. Uh, we remain optimistic that those numbers will decline further, but it's quite clear at the moment uh, that they're very significantly elevated over and above where we started, and still uh, a huge um, uh, workload uh, on our healthcare system, and a very significant risk uh, at present. Thank you. So have any questions, Richard? Tony Richard Chambers from Virgin Media News. You said earlier on in the week that this would go down to the wire in terms of the decision making on the easing of any restrictions. Uh, have you made your mind up at this point? And you must be aware that there will be a lot of people who will probably be very, very disappointed uh, by what news comes out tomorrow. Uh, so we're getting closer to that point of making our mind up. We meet again tomorrow morning to consider all of the information, that some of which you've heard here this afternoon, uh, and to make our our, if you like, our assessment and to make available to government the advice uh, that, that uh, um, arises from that assessment. Uh, as I think we've been signalling for some time, um, if we look at all of the measures that we think are important in terms of the, of the progression of this disease, notwithstanding the progress that we've made, uh, we think that the case hasn't arisen yet to give us, if you like, a reason to believe that now is the time for us to lift restrictions. So my view on that over the course of the last week or 10 days hasn't, hasn't changed as a result of the data that we've seen. Even though we've seen, and you can even look at the graph that's there, we have seen further improvement over the course of the week. Uh, in, in every measure that we're, we're sharing with you, we have seen improvement. And that's all giving us encouragement. But we need to get down to a lower baseline. The number of cases that we're picking up in the population generally now, in and around, so I've given you a figure there today of um, uh, 359 new 
you can work out from the number of additional cases in the nursing home sector, 227 of those are in the nursing home sector, but we're still seeing a number that's in and around 100, 200 cases a day from the population in general. Those were close to the figures that we were seeing each day back in March when we were introducing these measures. The numbers that we've had, as uh, Philip has said, uh, in intensive care unit uh, now and the numbers in hospitals overall right now are bigger than the numbers that were in those settings. And even though we're dropping as opposed to rising with those numbers, they're still big numbers. Uh, and if we were to, if we were to, um, uh, to not take that into account, there's a risk that if further spread in the infection were to occur, uh, it, we would get into difficulty sooner than we would if, 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 uh, if, if we had lower numbers from which to, um, um, to make, make our recommendations. So we have over 100 people in ICU at the moment. That's heading for 40 or 50 percent of the standing capacity that was in place in our intensive care units in the country before this began. So it's, it's a sizable number still. Just in terms of, of you know, you've been under pressure from different cabinet ministers and different people in different interest groups have been pushing for some easing of restrictions. Is there any restriction in particular which gives you the most anxiety about lifting? That one, one that has come up repeatedly, whether it be older people who are cocooning, allowing them out for, for walks every day. Is there any particular measure which people have been calling for which you'd be the most uneasy about lifting in the short term? So, I mean, I understand there have been a variety of different uh, calls, from, and they're very understandable uh, from right across society, and we consider all of these ourselves. The approach that we take is a, a risk-based one. Uh, we look at the extent to which we think risk might be increased by working through uh, a, a given set of measures, and we look at those measures in groups according to the kinds of activities that they relate to. So retail is a kind of activity, obviously. Uh, economic activity in general, um, uh, activity around sport and cultural activities and so on, the operation of the health service. We look at each of these in turn and try to identify what might be an appropriate path through those, starting, with, starting if we are to ease restrictions with the measures that introduce the lowest risk. What we'll have to do then is leave an interval of a period of time to allow us to see if changing that measure and the change in behaviour that, that, that results from that, either directly or indirectly, and I'll come back to that, has led to an increase in the reproductive number, an increase in the behaviour of the infection, an increase in the number of infections uh, or admissions to intensive care units or hospitals or any other measure that gives us cause for concern that's beyond what we might have expected. We obviously want to be in a situation whereby we step our way through uh, um, easing of restriction in a way that doesn't cause us to have to go back and reintroduce some of the restrictions that are in place across the site. That's what we want to avoid is a situation whereby we take a step and then we have to, to take a step backwards. And I don't think anybody wants us to be in that situation, so we want to have the highest degree of assurance of that that we can. So what we try to do is anticipate what we think the direct behavioural effect might be, how much extra activity will that involve, how much more, as it were, social mixing will that involve and contact uh, between people, uh, and then try to, uh, try to uh, uh, measure or, or, or take account of if you like the anticipatory behaviour I've spoken to you about before, uh, whereas we might we might say we're introducing a particular easing of measure, what people might hear is we're now starting to lift restrictions and people start to get ahead of us, as happened when we were introducing measures. In, in, in the, the people that we recommended uh, for cocooning were already cocooning at the point at which we introduced that measure. If we look at that issue happening in reverse and people get ahead of us, We'll end up with behaviours that we don't want to see. Uh, we'll end up with spread of infection that we haven't anticipated, and we might end up having to, to take steps to, to reverse that. So we want to avoid that and to really step our way through this very slowly and very carefully. Whatever the situation, and I'll finish on this point, uh, we will be emphasising on a continuing basis the importance of personal behaviours around uh, uh, respiratory etiquette and hand hygiene, the importance of maintaining those, the importance of maintaining social distance and physical distance, and the importance of being very responsive to common cold-like symptoms. And as I've said before, the kind of environment in which culturally it will, be, it will be unacceptable for us to mingle, to mix, to come to work, to go to school with these kinds of symptoms uh, in order to limit the transmission of this particular infection. Last one for me. Is there a specific concern, though, about people who are amongst our over 70s who are currently cocooning about them going out and walk? Because some people feel that that's a very low risk activity, that what harm is it if they're going out for a walk? But is there any specific concerns about 
what alleviating that measure might do. Look, what I'll say to you about that tonight is that, look, we understand the challenge that that represents for individuals, uh, people over the age of 70, people in vulnerable groups who are, we've asked to cocoon at home. It's a very difficult measure. We've also had that arrangement in place in effect for people living in similar circumstances in nursing homes. It's also challenging for people in those kinds of environments, having experienced in particular the higher rates of infection that we've seen in those communities. We won't have those measures in place for any longer than we think are necessary, or is necessary, sorry. Thanks, Richard. So David Quinn, Sunday Times, a question for Philip. Um, so if I understood correctly, um, you're saying if we had stayed with social distancing only, and had not gone for the full lockdown, the situation facing hospitals would have got much, much worse over time. Now, Sweden, as we know, stayed with social distancing, didn't close primary schools, didn't close pubs, didn't close restaurants, allowed gatherings of up to 50 people. And its hospitals and its intensive care units have never been overrun. Its death rate is about the same as ours. It has roughly the same population density as Ireland, so it's, I mean, not all countries can be compared. Obviously, there's all kinds of variables. And the epidemiologists in Sweden are insisting that they have it right, and this is the way out of it. Um, and they say their figures are now showing it. And they were right to remain with social distancing, not go into lockdown. So does this perhaps indicate, or at least give us pause for thought, that our modelling may be incorrect, and that our social distancing original strategy might have been the correct one. And again, I just come back to the question, if we're correct, and we had to go beyond social distancing and had to close the primary schools and the pubs and the restaurants and keep gatherings extremely low, why haven't the Swedish hospitals been overrun? So it's, it's important, first of all, to distinguish kind of the, the headline, what's going on in a country from how the population is actually behaving. So it, it, yes, schools and so on, but the reality is that in Sweden, there's a huge amount of social distancing going on, and mm -hmm. as the population uh, uh, goes about their business, they're observing very, very strong hygiene and social distancing behaviour. So that's issue number one. Uh, issue number two, I, I, I don't think that our modelling is wrong, incorrect, or, or is wrong, in, in quotation marks. Um, We've got to look at the rate at which the disease was spreading when that step was taken and what happened immediately afterwards. So look at, looking at the bend in the curve of cases, uh, numbers in hospital, and numbers in intensive care, that's not modelling. That's simply plotting the data and showing that the intervention had an enormous effect. So the second point is, if you're, st if you're in a position where you have a substantial amount of the disease seeded in the population, however it got there, and it's spreading very, very rapidly. Uh, simple social distancing measures, so to speak, will not mitigate that. So it's quite clear in the run-up to taking those strong social distancing measures, the disease was accelerating very rapidly, and as soon as those measures were taken, the acceleration of the disease stopped. And that's good news for us as a society because it means we know that that works when and if we're required to do it. The final comment that I'd make is diff different countries have different strategies. They're appropriate to their own context. Um, uh, uh, Sweden has a sig significantly smaller epidemic than we were dealing with back then. Um, and we'll have to, we will have to wait and see what happens in Sweden over the coming weeks, just as we're watching and seeing what will happen in Denmark, what will happen in Austria, what will happen in Germany. Um, so, uh, with many of these things, you make a judgment based on the data you have. Short-term outcomes show you something, and you have to wait a long time before you can say, would strategy A have been better than strategy B? What we know is that the strategy adopted here uh, did the thing it was required to do, stop the spread of the disease in its tracks there and then, because we could not have coped with further spread of the disease beyond where we were. Okay, and um, just a, a simple question maybe for um, uh, Tony. Um, would you uh, put on the daily briefing uh, press release maybe a separate section for nursing homes, because I think that might be helpful in terms of analysing 
Sure, yeah, yeah, I consider that absolutely, David. Yeah, no, no, no difficulty in that. And I'll just to add to what Philip was saying there's about Sweden and other countries, and I'm not suggesting you're doing this, it is definitely too early to, to, to get into a space of concluding on the basis of any observed data thus far which strategies were right and which were wrong. On a continuing basis, we have to be able to learn, but we're not in a situation where I think we can conclude that what has been done in Sweden has worked, uh, what has been done in other countries hasn't worked. Um, and we'll continue to monitor that situation uh, and report to you on what we see. Thank you. Thanks, David. Hey, Tony. Uh, Shane Beattie from News Talk. Um, the first question is the one I ask every evening. If you were to advise the government this evening, what would your advice be? Uh, the advice now would be that we shouldn't lift the, the restrictions. The same as answer I gave you uh, on each of the last number of occasions when you asked me. Um, so it's obviously very unlikely that it's going to change by tomorrow then. Uh, I, again, as I think I was thinking as the week went on, we were, in a sense, getting closer and closer to that point, and it was becoming less and less likely. There was less room, in a sense, for the kind of improvement that I think we need to see. We've seen improvement in the number of people in ICU. That number has, in fact, fallen quite a bit in, uh, in, in, in the last number of days since we've been particularly focusing on it and what we've given to you in the course of the evenings of this week. Um, but it's still at a number above 100. Uh, which is still a substantial portion of our ICU capacity, as I've already said, uh, and given that it's larger than the number of ICU admissions that we were dealing with, albeit that that was a rapidly increasing trajectory at the point we introduced those measures, we have to take that, uh, uh, by way of example, into account. We have further progress to make in that. And, Philip, your advice to the government, if you're asked this evening or tomorrow, indeed, what would you say? You, you've, you've heard here what I'll tell the National Public Health Emergency Team tomorrow. So I don't advise government. I contribute to the, the NEFIT, give them the data that we have, and, and the group interprets that and advises onwards. Um, thank you. Um, the, there's a lot of talk that, that and Thishak has said this, about we, get a, we give a roadmap to the Irish people about where we might be at certain points, depending on ICU admissions and infection rates and all of that. You mentioned there to Richard's question that there's a danger that we could have uh, anticipated reactions that people, if they hear one restriction being lifted, that they might. Is there not a danger with a roadmap that if we say to the Irish people, in two weeks this may happen, in four weeks this might open, that people will go ahead of you then again? Uh, I think the intention, if, if we set out a roadmap, will be to give people a sense of the, the, the direction, uh, to continue to share, if you like, the task of managing this with the, with the Irish people, uh, to invest, if you like, trust and confidence in people as we've done so far, that we will get the kind of behaviours that we need to get on a continuing basis. That has worked for us as a country here too far in the sense that it has got us into the position we're in now where we've been able to suppress the infection to the extent that we, we have, where uh, uh, we have never seen more than a thousand cases in a day here, whereas once in a, we, we, we could have predicted uh, well above 100,000 cases in a single day if we didn't have any impact on the spread of this infection. So we've done a significant job as a population and I think what our intention will be to advise government uh, around what the steps might be through a, through a, a, a path, if you like, of easing re restrictions. And I think that will do is give people a sense of what the kind of... Uh, um, uh, the plan, the approach, and give people and, and reveal to people in a way uh, the way we should be collectively be thinking about this. It will emphasise uh, the importance, as I've already done, of continued high standards of personal behaviour in terms of limiting your individual risk, your family's risk, uh, of, of passing on this infection, of responding appropriately when infection arises, and all of those really important messages. A new way of living, if I can put it that way, that, that limits the transmission of this infection as we step our way through. And I think we have a high degree of confidence that we will get the right kinds of behaviours that we want from the population. It will be a challenging message as we step back through uh, measures, but we, we will monitor the effect of each individual step uh, with, with an interval of at, le at least three weeks uh, between those steps uh, to give us the assurance that we haven't seen something unintended, that we haven't seen the population in the way that mm -hmm. you've described getting ahead of us and that leading to uh, a dangerous or a worrying spread of infection that might lead us to take some further action uh, before we think about or recommend uh, any further steps. So we'll work uh, in, in that way all the way through this. Mm -hmm. So if a roadmap is set out, we will at each stage along the way be considering where we're at 
uh, our, our team and giving advice on whether we should do something more, whether we should stay where we are, or whether we should uh, um, tighten our, our restriction again, depending on what we see in, in, in the spread of infection. Okay, and just a final question sure. from me. There's lots of reports on social media of uh, people queuing outside German retailers uh, to buy, we'll say, goods that you can buy ordinarily in garden centres, things like gazebos and stuff like that. You've said before that hardware stores aren't an essential service, that they, they shouldn't be open, they weren't on, on the list. Is it appropriate that some of these types of supermarkets or petrol stations are able to sell gardening goods and hardware goods when those type of shops can't actually open? I'm not going to get into uh, implicitly or otherwise criticising uh, shops and stores for the for the fare that they carry. Um, look, we've seen um, uh, we've set out a list, if you like, of what we think are essential services. Uh, we have seen um, uh, a high degree of compliance on the part of of those who provide services that are that are that are not uh, on that list of essential services. They've continued to remain closed. We'll set out a roadmap on that. We'd hope and expect that every part of society, uh, whether that's people in retail or whether that's people visiting retail environments, will in good faith continue their cooperation with us. Okay, thank you. Now, Leslie from the Mirror, uh, just to fill up, I know you've said there uh, your advice to, to the government would be uh, tomorrow would be not to lift any restrictions. I'm just wondering, you're more intimately, you know, uh, aware of all these figures and you study them, you said before, you, you look at them all the time. Do they offer you any insight that you would share with us as to when you think restrictions might be eased, looking at through the various charts you have? So, first of all, I didn't say my advice to government would be anything. Uh, uh, I, I contribute the, these data to NEFIT and, and NEFIT synthesizes advice um, for government. The, sh the short form uh, is I can't give insight as to when. Um, uh, the, the, the trends in uh, hospital numbers and ICU numbers are, are what I expect them, expected them to be. In other words, it would take time for those numbers to start to fall, and they're now starting to fall, and I would expect that they would fall pretty quickly. Uh, so that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, it, it, it will take a modest amount of time for this to work through the system. It's uh, a little bit worrying that the numbers in hospital are not falling as quickly as one might expect, and we need to understand why. Um, and, and the final point I would make is the uh, data sh strongly shows the power of people by uh, understanding and respecting the importance of social distancing to, to drive the disease out of the population. And if we drive it out of the population, then it will drive out of hospitals and out of long-term residential care settings. So, uh, so I can't give you an insight into when, but I can give you an insight into how. In other words, the more successful we are as a population in suppressing transmission of the virus within the general population, the more successful we will be at protecting healthcare workers and protecting people in long-term residential care. Okay, sorry, and I'm also just wondering about that peak period in March when the figures were starting to, to become alarming and uh, measures were then introduced and we seem to be saying, if I understand now, we shouldn't really go back to easing any of those restrictions because of the numbers we were seeing then, but I think, isn't it not also the case that feeding into that period would have been a lot of travel, a lot of international travel, the, the weekend that the Six Nations game happened here with the Italian fans? When we were, Type of activity we're not definitely going to go back to. We don't think in the short term. So, does that not suggest that there could be some amazing measures? We won't have all that again, and that those things were, were feeding into those numbers at that time. More, more importantly, what you were looking at there was the effect of effectively untrammeled transmission. So th this was the very early phase of, of the epidemic, really before any measures had kicked in. So you were seeing the effect of what had happened in the run up to the 13th of March playing out in the run up to the 28th of March because it takes time for people to get unwell and to require hospitalization and require intensive care. So, so I can't be certain, but I don't think we'll see a week like that again because it was, it was the uncontrolled transmission of the virus in the weeks prior to the 13th of March that led uh, to that week. But I can't be certain. That's the first thing. You've got to be 
Uh, that would have included that period when we had a lot of yes. people coming in from Italy. So, 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 so that so would have fed into those, that, that large spike. I think more than the travel, it was the fact that as a population we were mixing and socialising and hugging and kissing as normal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a question of travel, I think it's a question of how we were, we were behaving normally and interacting normally yeah. and transmitting the virus easily in, in the run-up to that. So, so if we were to experience another s- surge, it, it perhaps would be a gentler one, but just let me be careful. I can't be certain of that. And we don't want another surge, as much because of, more because of the people who will be very unwell as a consequence than of the, on the load in the healthcare system. So I think that very sharp rise is typical of an early unmitigated epidemic uh, due to the fact that the virus can transmit freely between people because they're interacting with, with each other in the normal active and kind of intimate ways that, that we do that we've sadly had to stop for Very a period unlikely of time. people will go back to that kind of behaviour I know no. they, they might run ahead of you but it's also reasonable to anticipate that people might be more cautious uh, to come back out as has happened I think in other jurisdictions where they have been reluctant to return to schools and shops when they were allowed so. people need to be People need to be very cautious in how they go about their daily business at any point in the future. You know, very cautious about those things about hand washing, respiratory etiquette, not shaking hands, maintaining that kind of distance. So they will be cautious. But, but just the point that needs to be made is that, inter, that intermediate state, the place we were in between the 13th of March and the 28th of March, we can't go straight back there. We've got to find some intermediate way of living that allows us to get on with things. And this is the challenge in terms of laying out uh, any kind of roadmap. How can we safely go about those things without transmitting the virus? Just to your point about the, uh, the, the, the uh, market survey information that we gather uh, and the focus group work that we do uh, is telling us that the population at large uh, is, is concerned about easing restrictions too soon and too early. And while there is, let's say, strong advocacy and very understandable advocacy coming from certain sectors and quarters and so on, the population is really concerned uh, that we do this in a careful and stepwise way. That's the way we're going to do it. Uh, That's the way we've been advised by the international bodies. Uh, And we won't be taking steps here that we think are going to introduce the kinds of scenarios that you're describing there and that Philip is describing of uh, free spread of the infection in the way that was occurring in the early days of this. Just to want to clarify the yeah. number there on the number in ICU, just on the press release, there's a figure on the back from yourself there, Philip, of 106 patients currently in ICU, or does that refer to a different timing? It refers to a different timing, so that's a figure that comes from, t- from, from today, today okay. from, from the morning count, which is a more up-to-date figure. So the up-to-date figure is 106, is it? Y- yeah, in so ICU? That's, what that's what I'm saying. It is continuing to drop, which is encouraging. Yeah, it's still a big number. Uh, the, the more detailed breakdown that I gave you there was done at an earlier point of the analysis, but that's just showing you that it's continuing to drop. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Jack, um, Jack Hogan Jones from the Irish Times. We have had a couple of days now of the revised case definition mm. uh, for testing. I talked to a few GPs today, and they seem to suggest that they're not putting forward a, a meaningful increase in uh, numbers for testing. Is that anecdotal data kind of reflected in what you're seeing? Is there, are there more people being sent for testing from the GP network, i.e. from the community? And if they're not, would there be a case effectively for making it easier for people again to get tests, for losing that case definition again? No, you're right, absolutely. Um, the early indication, and we've had a couple of days of this now, and we'll give this better and proper consideration tomorrow morning when I've got all the data from today as well, seems to be that yes, there has been an increase in referrals, it hasn't been beyond the numbers that we might have been projected, projecting, and we're going to give further consideration to that question tomorrow at the, the, uh, the NEFIT meeting. Uh, so we widened the clinical cr- uh, component of the case definition. What we didn't do was, so, and we kept the, the pre-existing prioritisation criteria. So we're going to look at that question tomorrow and see what has been, in fact, the increase in referrals. That is, there has been an increase. We have a, a network of GPs uh, through GP Buddy who've done really good work to help us to understand some of this and we're really grateful to them to see uh, what the increase has been and what in fact might, it might it have been where the prioritisation criteria not to apply. So that's giving us good information uh, which we'll take into account along with the information we'll get from the HSE on the daily numbers of people coming through the sampling referral process and the numbers being tested. 
and we'll make a, a decision on that tomorrow as to whether we need to uh, stick with the existing prioritisation criteria or whether we can effect remove those from the, um, the case definition. And, so. the, and that presumably would have a significant uptake effect then if you didn't have to clear that second hurdle of being in a priority group. It, it will have an, it will have a, uh, an increase uh, effect. Uh, and but we want to be sure of that it's not going to have an effect that's beyond our capacity to test, and we don't think that it will. But we have to take to, to make that form and assessment tomorrow. I'll give you a sense of that, including the numbers that feed into that discussion uh, tomorrow evening. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, that there's obviously a lot of different inputs into the decision to relax restrictions. Um, is there any number? I think I think Philip mentioned people in hospital. Is there any number that is proving particularly stubborn, particularly tranche, and not coming down as fast? as you might like it to, um, and do you have any kind of early theories as to why that might be? Uh, so th there is still a persistent number in hospital uh, hospitalised uh, and, and in intensive care units. We'd like to see that dropping. Uh, there are conditions that attach to people for discharge from hospital, uh, which might play a role so that if people are to be discharged to certain settings, the requirement to have uh, negative tests arises. So those are all things that can play into the length of time that people spend in hospital. Uh, but to also point out, it isn't just the number remaining in hospital. We're seeing a continued number, albeit a dropping one, 30, 40 a day to hospital overall. Uh, and although it's down as low as four now, something in the region of you know uh, mid single figures each day going into intensive care. And when the average length of stay in our experience is somewhere in the region of 10 to 14 days, at that number, that can still contribute quite an amount of occupancy on a continuing basis if it isn't also matched with a significant reduction in the number of people or an increase in the number of people being discharged from, from intensive care units. So uh, we want to see that pattern continuing. As I've said, the intensive care unit number is dropping uh, quite a bit and it's down now to just above 100 in total. That's the most, let's say, up-to-date estimate. We'd hope that over the coming days it will continue to drop further, but it's still a big number. Just very quickly, and last question. Um, sure. Earlier on in the week, there was a lot of discussion about this Kawasaki syndrome type disease that had emerged in some children in the UK. I know there's a, there's a low number of children on the island of Ireland who have exhibited these symptoms. Is that something that you're tracking, keeping an eye on? Are there more children presenting with this type of syndrome in the Republic or indeed on the island? Uh, so there was an alert put out as a result of the experience in the UK through the early warning report system through the, the WHO to raise consciousness awareness and awareness among our clinical community. And I know there has been a very small number of, of children who are ill uh, with this particular infection in which that particular diagnosis has been considered. That's only appropriate in the context of clinical care that our clinical uh, experts in the world of paediatrics will give consideration to that particular uh, alert that has, has been issued. Uh, and if we get any reports or, and formal notifications of that, we can, we can, we can update you with those. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jack. Um, Philip Mark Ty from the Sunday Times. Um, today, Simon Harris talked about um, modelling, um, I presume this modelling probably from your epidemiological advisory group, predicting or saying that there could have been 4,800 deaths by now, but we've managed to keep that down to just around 1,200, just under 1,200 when he, when he sent that out. So as, as part of your work it, it, that we don't see it includes forecasting and modelling, is that something you'd be able to make available to the public and academics? Because I know speaking to some academics, there's a lot of concern there that they can't see what you're basing your models on and they can't drill into the data like they would in other data, be it economic data. Is that something you could make available for the sake of transparency? It's a, at some point, the, the work that we're doing would be subject to peer review. and It's a, it's a large group anyway, so there's a lot of peer review that goes on within the group. Uh, um, a great deal of this data is already available publicly through the HPSC uh, website, and we, we have had inputs and critiques from academic colleagues who say, when I look at the data, I get this, um, and you seem to get something different. So there will be a a currency amongst academic colleagues at the moment about the data that we're producing and, and, and their comments on it. But I would, I would expect at some point in the, in the future that the data will be submitted for publication and, and, and peer reviewed in the normal way. But like you'd be, you'd be sharing forecast data with different uh, regimes possibly or different scenarios at the moment, but that's something you can't share with us at the moment. Not, not at the moment. I think the particular one that you're referring to is a simple enough analysis that yeah. we did of if we had continued to grow at this number per day and gotten to this peak, it would have involved this number of deaths by, and that's where that 4,800 figure came from. So we're at around now, yeah. had we continued to grow 
at the rate at which we th thought we were growing when we closed schools, we would have had close to 5,000 deaths in total, Correct. I think, at around the end of this month, right around the, this it, point it, it, it is that SEIR model that, that yeah. we've shown with, with, with peaks at different uh, reproduction numbers, uh, and then the uh, forecasts of um, hospitalizations, intensive care, and so on are based on the literature and also on ECDC guidance. Um, so, so the methodology is transparent, I think. You want, maybe later we could get some detail on who's on the Irish Chef team. You don't have to give it now. I think that's published. Yeah. That's yeah. published in the governance document. The governance yeah. document. So, okay. Yeah, there's a, all the subgroups, membership and so on, is set out in the governance document, yeah. Okay. Um, I just had a query just about Nursing Home Ireland. We were seeking to get on um, one of the subgroups of Neffet. The, I think there's a Nursing Home subgroup of the Vulnerable Persons subgroup. Is that correct? And they, they, they were looking for membership. Is that something you've considered? Uh, no, we, 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 uh, we've had input uh, from HICWA, who's the regulator of that sector. HICWA is on, on both the, um, the Neffet itself um, uh, and the chief, exec the chief Executive and Deputy CEO are all, all part of our the NEFIT committee itself, uh, as well as feeding into the work of the vulnerable group. Uh, and so we've had access, if you like, to not only the HSE, which has the direct responsibility for nursing home, both direct provision and funding of private nursing home care, uh, and also the regulator. But not, not the actual private nursing homes themselves? Not the don't... private nursing homes association. Why is, no. why is that? Well, because that's a representative organisation. This, this, is, this, is this is an expert body of people with expertises and responsibilities directly for the provision of those services. So representative organisations, whether they're in relation to nursing homes or staff organisations, uh, we haven't brought uh, uh, into the, the membership of NEFIT, and I, I think appropriately so. And the Minister's made that clear in public already. Okay, and just a final question on um, the bringing in of, or, um, of um, foreign workers for agricultural work and horticultural work. Um, I just wanted to see if there's any update on I know you were expressing some discomfort about the Keelings workers and the way they came in. Is there, is there any update on um, how that should be done and what was done wrong, possibly in that case? Uh, I think in the context, in the context uh, um, of, of the, uh, the infection that we have in this, in this country uh, and the infection that we have in Europe at the moment is that we, we in public health terms would have to raise a concern about the significant movement of people um, uh, uh, f when for reasons uh, that uh, of activity that could be could be provided for through other means, uh, and where it's non where it's not where let's say the essential requirement for those individuals to be part of that movement might not arise, where the means to which those individuals are moved might make compliance with social distancing requirements uh, difficult. So we want to do, and the public health advice that we have in place at the moment is we limit activity as much as possible to essential activity. Uh, the people who are involved in the provision of that essential activity, we want to see their protection uh, being about uh, a high standard of, of observation of all of the public health advice that we give in terms of hand washing, respiratory etiquette, social distancing, and so on. Um, we were asked about something that had already taken place at the point at which it had taken place and asked whether that was something that we were, uh, I think the question was posed in terms of comfortable with in terms of uh, an exemplar of how our public health advice would be applied and I don't think that it could reasonably be ar argued by anybody that, that it was. And so, but should, should that be allowed in the future? Is there, is there going to be any change in, in work companies or farmers bringing in large numbers of horticultural or agricultural workers? So what, we, can't what we will do and what we're going to be doing now is having considered uh, on a risk-based approach all of the activities that we will make recommendations on and it won't be down at the level of each individual component of the economy, you'll understand that, uh, is to take a risk-based approach and set out a framework through which decisions around um, uh, easing of restrictions by government would be made, uh, taking into account our public health advice. We will apply that advice at stages along the way, as, we, as we've said, to specific questions as they arise. But the broad framework uh, we have been working on for some time, and we intend to have that as the base of the advice that we set out, and that will be the means to which we will apply a question prospectively or an analysis prospectively to any given situation like the one that you're just describing. Michelle Hennessy from the Journal.ie. 
Um, you mentioned last night that you were seeing uh, admissions to ICU from the community, and that you were uh, that it was a challenge to attribute those to a, a particular source. Is that because the contact tracing system isn't where it needs to be at the moment, or when we do get to a stage where we're relaxing restrictions, how can we address that challenge in the community? Uh, no, it's not because of the contact tracing. It's simply the case that somebody is admitted to an int intensive care unit, for example. And we know that people who are admitted to intensive care units are usually admitted to, to intensive care units either directly on the day of admission to hospital or early in the course of their, their hospital admission. The diagnosis is made and it may well be at that point that the individual and those attending the individual in terms of provision of care are not able to identify the source of, of that particular infection in that particular individual. That's really all I'm saying. That's what it amounts to. Uh, and that's not a surprising thing. What you'd like always to be is in a situation where you can explain each case of infection in terms of where that person picked it up. But it's not the situation uh, uh, that pertains to every case, and we've had a challenge with community transmission. So community transmission is a case arising where we're not able to provide an explanation as to how that person uh, picked that infection up, and it gives you a sense that there is infection undocumented, if you like. Um, uh, in, in the wider population. Clearly an individual has picked it up if the diagnosis has been made, uh, but we're not able to say how. We couldn't attribute that to a weakness in contact tracing. Okay, uh, the British Medical Journal reported today that an antibody test that's apparently 99% accurate has been certified for use in the EU. Are we looking at using that here? So we've seen that report. I think, uh, as you know, Dr Maureen Ryan was here recently and we were the, I think we were the first country in Europe to do a full health technology assessment looking at these kinds of tests and at that point uh, we felt that the evidence wasn't uh, robust enough around any one test. I think that remains the case. I, I've seen that report. Uh, it does look promising but the number of uh, subjects within that study was, was less than 100 in terms of the positive tests. Uh, so I think it's something that we need to keep under review. Clearly we're hopeful that an antibody test that we can use uh, that would be robust, accurate, sensitive, uh, will be available sooner rather than later. But I think it's, at this point it's too early to say that, that, is, that that's the one. Okay. Um, just one final one for me that I said I would ask for somebody. There was a, a woman who was stopped um, going into a supermarket with her two kids. She's a single parent. Uh, and it, it seems that this is anecdotally still happening now. I know you said before that, that doesn't need to be the case. Can you maybe just remind uh, people who are working in and managing supermarkets that it doesn't need to be done and shouldn't be done? So uh, in the scenario you're describing where you have uh, a mother with children who are clearly household contacts um, and there isn't a requirement therefore for those to social distance from one another as they go through a supermarket and I think if a mother's looking after children in that situation I think that, that would be a difficult thing uh, for, for um, a mother of small children. I think we'd all understand that uh, and I'm sure that all responsible supermarkets will make every effort they can to try to ensure that they provide access to people in those situations as they're doing to the rest of the population. Thank you. Um, Rob O'Hanner and Joe.ie, can I just clarify on the healthcare numbers given um, the five deaths that were reported, they're the same as were carried over from the previous week, so there have been no reported deaths of healthcare workers in the past week, is that correct? Yeah. That's yes, correct. okay. That's thank correct, you. Yeah. Um, and finally, from myself, can I just ask, there's a piece uh, published by Philip Ryan in The Independent there uh, just before the beginning of the briefing, and he spoke about Cabinet putting pressure uh, on yourself, Dr. Gillen, to ease, for example, cocooning restrictions. Um, are you, is this kind of pressure from government who have to, I suppose, deliver the message and manage the message? Is that making your job any more difficult? Did, uh, did, uh, the source of the, the, the story I missed in the beginning of your question? It's Philip Ryan from The Independent. Oh, yes. So, uh, uh, Dr. Glynn and I gave a briefing to uh, most members of the cabinet today. Uh, we provided information to them about the infection, our analysis. We had a good exchange of information, answered questions that arose. There was no pressure being placed on us that was in any way inappropriate during the course of that meeting, whatever that report might suggest. Thank you. Probably from RT News. Um, can I just ask, has there been any thought being given to lifting restrictions at different times in different parts of the country, given the different levels of the virus it's found, for example, in rural Kerry versus Dublin? So that's something we, we would give consideration to on an ongoing basis as to whether there was a case for that to arise uh, or not. We don't believe that case arises at this point in time to take a differential response, if you like, to the lifting 
uh, uh, or the easing of measures when we think we're at the right point in time in relation to that. But there will be nothing to stop us, if you like, arising at that, arriving at that kind of analysis at a point in time if we felt the conditions were such that that, 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 that was justified. I think I pointed out before that as we uh, 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 introduced the, the three sets of measures, we did give consideration as to whether a regionalised response in the east of the country might be justified because at that time the burden of infection, if you like, in the east of the country, in particular in Dublin, was, was much, much higher than the rest of the country. Uh, but ultimately we, we felt that the, uh, the case wasn't there to, to justify introducing regionalised restrictions in the way that has been done in a number of other countries. And I just point out to you, in, in many of those countries when they did that, uh, it, it wasn't long until they had to extend those to other geographic regions. So possibly, but you would need, Wouldn't really do you know what you need to see before that would happen? Or? Uh, so if, if we felt that there was sufficient, either in terms of the effective implementation of restrictions or easing of restrictions, that we could limit behaviours, if you like, to a particular geographic region, if we felt there was a specific uh, justification in terms of the spread of the infection. But right now we're not seeing any such justification. So theoretically it's possible. I, I'm not anticipating that we'll be in a situation where there'll be different measures in place, uh, or easing of different measures uh, at different rates and different times in different parts of the country. Not at this moment in time, Shane. Thank you.